Welcome back students. In this lecture, we're going to talk about loading data from spatial light into QGIS. But before we see how to do that, I want to attempt to answer the question, what exactly is spatial light? Because I think it's pretty amazing technology with a lot of potential. But even though it's been supported in ArcGIS since version 10.2, I think it's largely been off the radar for Esri users. Spatial light is an extension to the SQLite database for storing and analyzing spatial data. Basically, it provides the same functionality to SQLite that PostGIS provides to the PostgreSQL database and ArcSDE provides to SQL Server, Oracle, and others. It's also a standards-based extension that supports the Open Geospatial Consortium's simple features for SQL specification. And that's a good thing because that means that it will be easy to use this data in a lot of other software as well. Okay, so that might raise the question, what exactly is SQLite? And the short answer is that SQLite is a file-based relational database management system. Unlike a true client-server RDBMS that's accessed through a call to a specific port in the server's operating system, SQLite is a single file that includes both the database engine and the data, which makes it very easy to install and use anywhere. In fact, it's thought that SQLite is the most widely deployed database engine in the world, because it can be easily embedded in virtually any device and in any type of application. And it can be accessed by almost every programming language and operating system in existence. SQLite easily handles many simultaneous readers, but writes to the database are sequential, unlike a true client-server database. The database is locked while writing occurs, but only for a very short period of time, usually, usually just a fraction of a second. So while it can handle multi-user access, it's not going to handle it as well as a true client-server database. And you can't have nearly as many users using it. So what would you use Spatialite for? Well, one common use is for transferring data between applications. For instance, if you have data stored in some other format that you're using in QGIS, such as PostGIS or GeoJSON, and you want to be able to send it to someone to open in ArcGIS, you have a couple problems. First of all, as a client-server database, you can't just copy your PostGIS database into a file and, se and send it to someone. Of course, in QGIS, you can save any layer as a shapefile, but shapefiles have a restriction on the length of field names and will truncate any field name that's longer than 10 characters, and this can cause problems. Shapefiles are also large and clunky and contain lots of files, and so you probably need to put them in a zip file before you send them to someone, and it just gets complicated. As a single file, it's just easier with the Spatialite database. SQLite can also serve as a backend for web applications. It's a single file, so you can just copy it to your web server, and it can be accessed in PHP or just about any other server-side programming language without needing to install a client-server database on the server. And you could easily implement a workflow where the Spatialite database being edited locally gets uploaded to the server on a regular basis to keep the data fresh. Also, because it's a single file, you can include the entire database in an application cache for offline use in mobile applications. And I've heard several differing reports on using SQLite as a database for multi-user editing applications in a networked environment. My general take is that it will work if you're reasonably certain that no two people will be attempting to edit the same data at the same time. But because of the way network file systems cache data, if you really need a true multi-user editing capability, you'd be better off with a real client-server database system. You can read the document at the web address in red for more information about whether this might be right for your specific situation. Now, if you're familiar with SQL queries, especially with Spatial SQL, you'll appreciate the ease with which Spatialite handles SQL. And we'll talk about SQL in much more depth later on in this course. But this means that you have the ability to create SQL views, which are virtual layers defined in a SQL query. It also means that you can use triggers, which are SQL programs that are executed in response to other database events. Maybe you want to create a buffer feature automatically when a point is added, or update a total in another layer when a value is changed. All of that and more can be automated in the database using triggers. Spatialite also supports transactions, so you can group database operations together in such a way that if any operation fails, the entire set of operations are rolled back, so that operations that should occur as a group are never halfway finished. And SQL works great for joining data from multiple tables into a single data set. In the spatial light, 
you can make those joins based on spatial relationships. For instance, joining all the raptor nests in a county polygon or within a specified distance from a pipeline. Even if you ultimately will be using a client-server database, Spatial Light makes it very easy to learn SQL for spatial operations without expensive software or a complicated installation. Spatialite can serve the same purpose in QGIS as a file geodatabase serves in the Esri ecosystem, except that while Spatialite is an open source specification, file geodatabases are a proprietary technology and they're not easy to work with outside of the Esri ecosystem. And they can't be accessed via SQL or support multi-user editing or any of the other uses mentioned above. All right, let's go see how to load data from Spatial Light into QGIS and ArcGIS. So with Spatial Light, we're starting to get into the idea of connecting to a database and not just loading data from a file. So one way to access the data is by right-clicking on the Spatial Light object in the browser panel and then clicking New Connection. And that's going to open up a file dialog box. And you can just navigate to where you're storing your Spatial Light file. In this case, it opened up automatically in this right place because that's the last place I've used it. So I'm just going to click djbasin.sqlite and open. And now that we have a connection, we can expand that and we'll see all our layers. Same layers that we've been looking at. And you can select a bunch, drag them down in, and just like with the file geodatabase, we have all our layers. We can see it's the same data even though it's not been symbolized. So that's one way. I'm going to remove all of these. The other way, which might actually be easier, is in the browser panel, you can just navigate to the directory where your spatial light data is being stored. And you can go down to this file, djbasin.sqlite, and expand it, and you can just add your layers in as you need. So that way it kind of hides a little bit about the fact that you're actually working with a database and you're making a connection to a database. But those are concepts that we should get used to once we start working with client-server databases. Now I'm going to remove this data, and I'm also going to go down and remove this connection. And I'll show you another way that we can access spatial light data and through the Open Data Source Manager, which can be accessed through this icon. We'll open up our Data Source Manager panel, and you can choose whatever data source you want to work with, including spatial light. Or you can access it through the layer menu. Just go to Add Layer, and then come down to Add a Spatial Light Layer. And again, that'll open the Data Source Manager already set to the Spatial Light tab. So we can just click a new connection, and it'll open the same file dialog box. We'll click Open, and then click the Connect button, and then it'll show us our tables down here. And then layers in here, you can just Select and click the Add button, and then we'll add them to our layers. And so there you see all the data for those, for those layers. Now I wanted to show you a real quick insight into how you can use SQL queries to create virtual layers. And again, we'll talk more about this later on in the course, but just to stimulate your thinking right now, I'm going to do a quick example. But I'm going to do it in QGIS version 2.18 because Again, I'm using a pre-production version, and in my pre-production version, I haven't been able to get it to work. But it looks like the process is the same as in version 2.18. So let's go there. I'm going to look in the Database tab in the menu and go to DB Manager, and that'll give us this dialog box. And then if I right-click on Spatial Light and click New Connection, we'll get this File Selection dialog box so I can navigate to the folder where my Spatial Light data is. Right there it is. So I'll click Open. And I'm not sure why it says Not Connected, but let's take a look at the Raptor Nest data. There it is. We can see some information about the data. This shows some triggers that have already been written that are created by default. We could add some other ones if we wanted to. But it shows us the fields in our data set, the type of geometry it is, the spatial reference, etc. You can also look at the features in this layer in table form under the table dialog. So this is our attribute table. And we have a preview tab as well. And that'll let us see preview the spatial extent of the data. 
Now to write a SQL query against this data, we have to open the SQL window, and then we can just write a standard SQL. And if you're used to SQL at all, if you've seen it, some of this will be familiar to you. For instance, we can say select recent species, last survey, and actually let's put nest ID first, and we'll say from, and then the name of the table, which is raptor nests. We'll put a where clause in there. Say where the recent status field equals active nest. Then I'll execute this query, and we'll see we get the data that we requested, but only where the recent status is active nest. Let's add the recent status in here just to prove that we're only getting the subset where the recent status is active nest. So there you can see if I browse through the data, we're only getting that particular subset. And we can also add an order by clause in here. We'll say order by the last survey date descending, and I'll execute it again, and now these are sorted by the last survey date in descending order, with the most recent survey at the top. So there's a lot that we can do with these, and we can also use some spatial functions in here. So for instance, I'm going to use this spatial function called buffer, and that's going to take two parameters, a geometry, and then a buffer value. I'll go 0 0.01 for now. That's a distance, but this data is in latitude, longitude, the coordinate reference system, and so this distance is going to be in degrees. So it's going to be a really small number. If it was in UTM or something that was in metric, we'd put in how many meters we wanted that buffer to be. So I can execute this now. We don't see anything in here because it's binary data. But if I click this, load as new layer, and then I'm going to set some options here. The column with unique values, say is nest ID, that's going to be unique. The geometry column is this buffer that we created. And then I'll give it a name. We'll say active nests buffered. And then I'll click load now. Now if I close this dialog box, we'll see we have just the active nests with a buffer of 0 0.01 degrees. And we can prove that by going to favorites, by navigating to where the original data is stored. We'll load a shapefile. Courses, Udemy courses, QGIS for ARC data, and we'll load the wildlife raptor nest. And we'll load it from GeoJSON this time. You can see all these other nests that don't have the buffer around them are from inactive or fledged nests. Again, can show this. I'm going to do this quick. We'll talk more about symbolizing later on in the course as well, but just for demonstration purposes, we're going to symbolize on the recent status column. Now we see these active nests are light blue, and everything that's light blue has a buffer around it, and all these other nests that have a different status don't have buffers. Now, this is kind of cool because in ArcGIS, we'd have to create our own buffer layer, and it would have to have the geometry, and that would all be stored on disk. And that takes up a lot of space, but in QGIS, with Spatialite or any other data that's stored in a database that can be accessed through SQL, you can create these virtual layers. The data is just a point. The buffer is created virtually using that stbuffer spatial SQL function. And so it doesn't take up any more space on disk than just the point. And really, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with a SQL query. You can do all kinds of joins based on spatial relationships and, and lots of other things, which we'll talk about in more detail later on in the course. So thanks for listening. In the next lecture, we'll talk about connecting to a PostGIS database and loading data from there. And we'll see you then. All right, thanks for listening. Just a reminder, this is one lecture in a course of about 80 similar lectures. So if you like what you hear, there will be a full-blown course called QGIS 3.0 for GIS professionals. It's going to be available in mid-December on udemy.com. I also have a few other available courses that mostly have to do with web programming. So if you're interested in web programming for GIS applications, I have an introductory course that's available now on Udemy. 
And this course really is a broad overview. It's about 13 hours of content, but it's a broad overview of web programming specifically oriented towards GIS applications. So we'll talk about HTML and CSS and JavaScript and some PHP and SQL as well. But we'll also talk specifically about the Leaflet JavaScript API for web mapping, the Turf JavaScript API for spatial analysis, and the PostGIS database for storing and analyzing data on the server. And then I have a more detailed course. It's also about 13 hours. It's just specifically about Leaflet and Turf. And I have a third course that's about four hours now, but I have a few lectures that I'm going to add to it. It'll probably end up being five or six hours, but it's about issues specifically related to creating mobile GIS and mobile mapping applications with Leaflet. So if you're interested in web programming, I'd encourage you to take a look at these courses. Right now you can use the coupon code COURSE3, all capital letters, to get any of these courses for $20. That's an 80% discount off the list price. So thanks again for listening, and keep an eye on my YouTube channel if you want to see more content that's going to be coming up.